All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome everybody to this week's version of Water Talks. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us, uh, welcome. And for those of you who have joined us, welcome back. I uh, hope everybody's had a good start to 2021 and is staying safe out there. Um, today, we are going to be talking about Enterprise's new cloud platform that is used for operational analytics, asset management. And today, we're really going to be focusing on the optimization of uh, either treatment of water or the distribution of water. Um, so today, I'm going to be kind of playing host. I, I have been on here a couple times. Um, so for those of you who I've not met, uh, my name is John Crochet. I am a regional manager at Enterprise. Uh, I'll be playing host today and, and doing most of the talking will be Javier Cantu. Uh, he is our director of AI for North America, or as he put here, the digital solutions architect. Uh, Javi, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Um, sure, John. Thanks. Um, my name is Javier, as, as John mentioned. Uh, at Innovise, I'm, I'm in charge of kind of putting together um, uh, uh, various components of our products to come up with very specific workflows. Uh, I am a professional engineer, been in the industry now for a little over 10 years uh, with my, with a focus on process mechanical engineering. Thank you, Javi. And uh, if you don't mind going to the next screen, Javi. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for those of you who haven't joined us before, um, the idea behind Water Talks, uh, which we do on a weekly basis, is really, you know, we're going to do a presentation or Javi's going to do a presentation in this case for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then we want to open it up for questions. So the idea here is if you guys have any questions for us, uh, there is no bad questions. Please put them in the dialog box as shown on the screen here. Uh, and Javi and I will be sure to pick those out during the presentation uh, and answer them to the best of our ability. And if we run out of time at the end, we'll definitely follow up with uh, all the questions that we have missed. Um, so, yeah, please uh, feel free to start putting in your questions at any point during the presentation, uh, and we'll be sure to answer those as we go along. Um, so, Javi, I'll turn it over to you now for the presentation, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, John. And it uh, doesn't look like I had the little questions column, but uh, just feel free to interrupt me and just ask me, all right? Yep. And uh, I'll be happy to to uh, answer whatever comes in. I'll take um, care of it for you, yep. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm really glad to have everybody here. Um, as John mentioned, we're gonna go over several things, but what I really want to also kind of help bridge the gap on is how Innovise is transforming a lot of our products and where we plan to be, you know, in 10 years and five years and all that kind of stuff and how our, how the difference in technologies today are transforming our business, not just in the software world, but also over in the in the uh, in the utility world and managing space, so we already know we've gone through a lot of changes in the last couple of centuries. We have that exponential S curve that we all know of, and today we are in that world of connectivity. We have the Internet of Things, sensors everywhere, cloud computing, edge computing, um, and today in specific, I want to go dive deep into AI, what it means, what it is and how we're using it in our, in, in our products so to make your outputs better and to hopefully facilitate a lot of workflows that we've already got going on. Um, so you may have seen this slide before or maybe not, but you know our data really is a game, state, uh, game changer, guys. Um, I remember just a few years ago where everyone was saying like water's a new oil uh, and uh, that was the trending headline. Um, for all of us here, well, obviously water is our business, right? Um, so it was kind of unfortunate when when all these media headlines kind of started shifting that that trending tagline to, hey, data is a new oil. Um, fortunately, though, uh, we can we can benefit from that because in the last several years, where that headline did change, a lot of advancements have happened, and uh, we've managed to find a lot of ways to leverage those technological advances in, in, in computing speeds and processing speeds, and also in ML uh, or machine learning types that we can actually start narrowing the gap on the fidelity of some of our model outputs. So um, data science, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, ML, 
Uh, you know, it's a very fast evolving field. And I don't know if anyone out there has uh, taken any courses on this or is in the, the midst of starting to learn more about it. But these conversations are changing uh, very, very often, and so are the definitions to these things. So for the sake of, of, of this water talks, uh, let's just look at data science as, you know, um, a, a, as a science as a whole. AI is a component of data science, and ML is a component of AI. I like to think of these things as little Russian dolls, uh, as not all AI has machine learning, but all machine learning is AI. You know, they all fit within each other. So what is machine learning? Um, in, in short, um, it's just a gathering an abundance of data and uh, recognizing a pattern, teaching a machine to mimic a human behavior, and then learning from the outcome of that behavior. Um, so if you look at my little robot here, um, we have uh, our little feeding the machine, uh, pattern recognition, of course, data correlation, finding correlations that we may not be able to see as humans because sometimes there's an abundance of data, uh, making a decision based off a controlling variable or some sort of changing variable, and then presenting that solution, of course, and feeding all those results right back in. Why is this important? Well, it, it autonomously uh, like creates this dynamic feedback loop. Meaning if there's a sensor out in your process, let's say whether it's your distribution network or any sort of treatment unit, and it's live feeding back into your SCADA, it, its results, and something wrong is happening, we can have the base numerical or physical statistical model in the background say, hey, that's wrong. That's outside of our compliance limits. Let's self-correct, let's adjust, and or let's uh, let's create a new operation scheme to to remain on target and on compliance. It's self healing, it's self organizing, and it's self learning. And this is very important in today's climate because we have uh, ever changing regulatory climate. Uh, we have climate change for one, aging infrastructure, and all those things can start affecting what our what our sensors actually bring back and read back to us. So the last several years now, actually, we've been working in the background uh, to modernize the digital twin. Um, if you're an ICM user, uh, InfoWorks user, uh, InfoWater, uh, or anything, or our asset management tools, all of these things are being modernized into what we're, we're essentially calling our modern digital platform. This is becoming Info360. Is this happening overnight? No, it's not. It's happening in phases and small little components. And uh, we're hoping to have all these functionalities that you see in today's product lines within that Info360 platform as features uh, so that we can leverage the power of AI and ML across all these data platforms. This becomes extremely useful when we really want to close the loop on that entire water cycle and understand how much water do I need to get out to my customers? How does that translate over to what goes into our sewers? How can we in incorporate weather data to determine I and I? And how do we start creating rate structures, uh, figure out what to bill people and automate our CIPs and CMMS systems so that we keep our systems up to date, right? Incorporating ML into making the correlations through all that data is gonna be a huge jump in how we manage utilities in the future. Hey, Avi, can you go back one slide actually real quick? Yeah. And just something I wanna add uh, for the audience because I think this is something that a lot of our existing clients and prospects alike have questions about. So, um, for those on the call, you might have heard about Info360, for example, as kind of a separate product. Uh, but what, what Javi is speaking to here uh, is really something that's already been developed in our cloud-based platform for really three major things, uh, asset management, operational analytics, and also for uh, optimization using the Imagine tool. So historically, all these tools have been separate solutions. And what we're doing now and what, what we have done, and you guys will hear a lot more about this throughout the year, 
uh, especially towards the end of February, is we've moved all those solutions that are you know really crunching a lot of data uh, and need you know that cloud-based platform for for better processing times and for better performance. That those are the solutions we're moving over to that cloud-based platform. So just to kind of paint the whole picture, uh, InfoWorks ICM, InfoWater Pro, InfoSwim, all those desktop modeling solutions aren't necessarily going anywhere. You know, those are still going to be our desktop hydraulic modeling solutions. But what you'll be able to do in the future is be able to pull different data points from basically this this kind of master database where you know, you're, you're maintaining all those asset management workflows, you're maintaining all those OA workflows. All that live data that's being connected, uh, being collected from the sensors in your field are being stored, you know, in this platform. So when you are doing your hydraulic modeling, you can not only log into that platform and do different workflows that you need to that are more OA or asset management based, but you can also pull in different data points that are collected on your assets directly into your hydraulic model. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to do here is the term digital twin, we all hear that a lot these days. And to be frank, I, we pro all probably get a little sick of it. <laughs> so in terms of Innovize and bringing it down to earth, this is what's what, what's happening at Innovize. Where all, our more robust solutions, that are, you know, those live solutions are going to be in the cloud. And you can pull you know, whatever data point you need down into your hydraulic model and use it uh, you know, for different analyses. So, yeah. Just want to paint that or vice versa. What's that? Or vice versa, because or really the versa. ultimate, yeah, ultimate the yeah. Uh, the goal is to not alleviate the 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 requirements of having to have like the most powerful machine over at your organization to run sure. your model, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make it so that anybody from any computer can log on, especially during times like this where we're all stuck at home, and run a model. And have it not take forever, right? That's that's the real value from here. Not just not just bringing in like all the ML data correlations across the water cycle, so we can make decisions. Of course, that's going to be great. But if we can do a numerical calculation in a uh, you know one thousandth of the second it normally takes, then uh, then there's a huge benefit here already in uh, kind of transforming some of our numerical analyses uh, uh, and doing those computations uh, on the cloud where we where we have more more share of some processing power. Yeah, we're getting deep in the weeds there. Javi's exactly right. It goes both ways. You, you, we act, you can actually load your hydraulic model onto the cloud platform so you can use it for like incident management and use it for some of the analyses that are within that platform. So a long term, you know, if you're running a simulation in InfoWater Pro or ICM, you'll be able to push those simulations to the cloud as well. Um, but for right now, you know, the, the focus has been getting all those uh, all those kind of live solutions uh, posted up there first. So um, sorry to hijack that slide, Avi. I'll let you continue. No, man. Uh, this is a conversation, right? <laughs> yep. Um, so I, would, I am going to want to go into some particulars on how some of those ML models work. But uh, I kind of want to just, uh, I mean, I wanted to pause anyways uh, as this little video plays. Uh, it's a small little demo of, uh, of what that i360 dashboard kind of is looking at and how you can play around and, and make uh, different workflows within it. Um, I wanted to pause, see if there are any questions in the chat right now uh, and what, so that we could maybe address them before I continue on here. No questions in the chat currently, so definitely encourage everybody, if you have any, to put them in the questions dialog box. But um, yeah, to go to this slide, to add a little bit to this, Javi, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with some of the functionality around uh, Info360 specifically, uh, really what, what Javi's showing here is the ability to, at the top, um, you can kind of create different, uh, we call them biz blocks, but you can use really your live data to create any type of uh, output or any type of calculation that you want uh, within the software. So there's a lot of built-in analytical tools that you can use to process that, uh, you know, raw data that's coming in. So that's one of the benefits of, of utilizing, uh, you know, our platform in conjunction with a modeling platform is you're not just using that raw data. Um, you're using the Info360 functionality to create whatever, KPIs or whatever type of uh, 
calculation that you want. And then that bottom part, uh, it looks like we're just showing a mass, a mass balance chart there. Um, but it's a good example of, of how you can get access to all of your data. Um, so really, at the highest level, um, when your live data is coming into our Info360 platform, it's being stored and I believe the typical format is like 15 minute intervals. Um, so what that means is it gives you the ability to really open up and take a look at all your historical data as well. So, you know, one of the issues that we see with a lot of our municipal customers is that data comes in and it kind of gets put on a shelf sometimes. Um, now you can, it's always kind of accessible through this platform. So you can take a look at, uh, you know, any kind of data point that you would like within, uh, within your simulation or within, you know, the time frame that you're looking at. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little bit on, on what we were looking at the last slide. And I'll throw it back over to you for this one, Javi. Yeah, so a um, couple of the, so when I think of I360, you know, it's bringing your data into a single place, but really what I want to stress on the powerful, how powerful machine learning makes these tools, because what it does for us that, you know, a lot of regular data uh, visualization software really just does, it, it really just visualizes data and you you manipulate it and it's very biased in the way that you can manipulate it as way unfortunately and, and though we can get into a talk on its own over like the bias of machine learning or ai or anything like that many of the models built around that that we build here uh, into imagine are you know are, are very numerical based based off uh engineering principles so that we can automate process and process and clean up time series data um, instead of going back and doing like some sort of like linear regression or anything like that where it doesn't necessarily make sense we can very cleanly identify where and how uh, based off data either upstream or downstream and iterate and start making inferences for data to clean up data sets that need that help uh, using ml right we could do real-time model calibration, uh, something that will go a huge, big far, uh, very, very far. And of course, uh, integrating all your CI, CMMS with ma asset management workflows, uh, CIP planning when it comes to water projects and distribution, uh, wastewater projects if you have split budgets uh, or anything of that sort. So I promise this is going to be the last time I use the word digital twin because I hate to use it myself, but uh, I need to at least reference it one more time in, when I start discussing machine learning because really what machine learning and what we've done around uh, our models is we've created a pretty good model that can abstract pretty much any process schematic or any process flow diagram or PNID that you may have available into that a real-time predictive model. And uh, really what that does is gives us that self-learning adaptive-based uh, uh, adaptive model, which we can continue to put inputs and outputs and get recommendations for those inputs and outputs. Um, in short, anything that has a PNID or may have a control panel associated with it, maybe at the asset level or on the on the system-wide level, like a SCADA program through, through a distribution system, can benefit from machine learning. Uh, we could look at, as, at a program as a whole to maintain pressures across entire, uh, 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 well, pressure, zone, pressure zones, or you know, uh, monitor and you know, re redirect water during high flow events. Anything like that that's already being done and somebody has to think about uh could be um essentially abstracted into these machine this machine learning model so that it can pick up and adapt based off of the physical sensors being collected um how it works i think uh i would you know in danger of repeating myself a little bit here uh anything that you have available any data set whether it's any of the ones listed here under step one, like uh, historian sensors or anything like that, or an internal uh, data set that maybe is developed in house, maybe like biosolids um, quality uh, spreadsheet or a spreadsheet for 
uh, a anything under the sun, maybe that's uh, maintenance activities or anything of the sort, can be brought in, we overlay upon each other, find, our, find those correlations, we apply a series of models associated with that. Some of them are water treatment specific, others distribution. I'll get into those here in a little bit. And of course, into a web dashboard where we, where we can show the data as it would be applicable to different uh, roles within the organization. If it's an engineer that wants to know, hey, what's a projection or, or what's a growth projection or where the, what's the trend of my system dynamics so that I can plan for the future, then they get their dashboard. If it's uh, the administration staff up there looking, hey, how, how do we need to adjust our rates? Or how can I track my system sustainability goals in terms of how many greenhouse gas emissions are, are we saving? How, how much less material are we using? They have their own dashboard. And of course, the operators have their early alarm dashboard or a schedule that is letting them know, hey, the next 24 hours, this is where the crew needs to go. Uh, whether it be pressure zone one or two uh, to change X pumps or or revive, or go and adjust the dosing of some sodium hypochlorite either at a plant or within a treatment system. Um, any questions as of yet, John? No, I, I think you kind of answered one on that last slide I, I, with the text, but uh, the one question was, you know, what what parts of the uh, water cycle, I guess, can, can imagine apply to? Um, I know you touched on that a little bit on the last slide, but anything you want to add to that? Yeah, in, in short, uh, all of them. <laughs> uh, all of them. We can do anything from a well system. Uh, like management and operations. So if you're trying to figure out, hey, which well are, should we should we be uh, adding into our distribu uh, distribution system from, uh, we can do distribution system optimization, which I'm just going to head towards right now and I'll come back, uh, where we can, instead of having to reanalyze and have these static studies every single or every couple of years uh, in that tells us, hey, this is where how much storage we need to keep and to maintain pressure. This is where our PRVs need to be set. We could use AI for that so that it can self-adapt to the demands of your day, uh, give set levels, and reduce the amount of energy required by high service pump stations. Um, in water treatment, of course, we use all the sensors associated with, um, with incoming flow, incoming uh, influent water quality and of course your effluent water quality and we can start optimizing towards uh, the chemical dosing required to optimize you know the flocculation process uh, or the membrane production process where we can decrease the amount of reject or you know increase the amount of uh, actual production through a membrane uh, filter backwash schedules, we can optimize around those so we're using less energy or preventing uh, specific um, uh, duplication of activities uh, when you have multiple trains. Um, and of course, all the energy and the pumping acquired within a plant can be looked at too. Uh, ultimately, when we look at anything in the sorts of water treatment, whether it be water or wastewater, um, we underlie those models with uh, a compliance model that essentially looks at the system as a whole. It's an operations management system and uses the constraints of whatever permit you may have. Uh, if it's a wastewater permit and you have a discharge permit that may have ammonia limits or and other nutrient limits. And of course, if you have a water treatment permit, you have all your suspended solids limits and, of course, and NTU. Right. So we look at those limits. We set that as a base model. We apply a risk factor to that risk model. And then within that one large model, set a whole bunch of little models. Maybe that's a chemical dosing model as shown here on the screen or an energy model to reduce the amount of energy required. Um, if we have filters that require, uh, require uh, assistance as well from the data those are little miniature models that sit inside this greater compliance model. Um, water distribution, I believe I 
just spoke to that. And then coming going down that water cycle, uh, wastewater collection, which I unfortunately don't have a, a slide here for, but uh, in wastewater collection, a study that we are we we're looking to do uh, here in SoCal is uh, in uh, dosing of odor control chemicals within the actual uh, trunk collection system in, in trunk lines. We have uh, a client of ours, which is you know spending millions and millions of dollars on just keeping uh, their dosing, uh, like, well, to optimize their dosing uh, of ferric uh, and magnesium for some cases so, to, so, um, into their collection system. And uh, what we would look at is analyze all the eight live H2O sensors, flow meters, and uh, any sort of metering station that was in the system uh, so that we could optimize and change that the dosing of those chemicals to maintain H2S levels below a certain threshold. For us, it was four, four milligrams per liter. And uh, with that alone, and being and creating that self-adapting um, model and process schematic, uh, they were able to get new schedules, daily schedules on how to do that. That can re that reduce their cost an additional 20% on on just chemicals alone. Uh, for systems such like that, it's relatively imperative to be able to have some of that live, real-time data because often what we find what's causing some of these excessive spend, whether it be in energy or, or chemical dosing, is that we don't have the capability really as operators. Um, I used to commission plants, but it's really hard when you have to go to the head of a plant, you know, clear a bar screen, and now you've got downstream, uh, you, you, you need to maintain proper disinfection levels. So what do you do while you're clearing a bar screen? you turn up your, your chlorine dose so that you have enough time to go and then come back, right? So one of the good ways that we can manage around that is we can set those schedules up front, predict with 24 hour look ahead where we really need to be and provide those calculations, automate those calculations and uh, based off real influent water quality. Uh, so that the, the operator spends less time thinking about where that needs to be, right? Um, uh, wastewater treatment, though, acts the same way as water treatment as shown here. Um, we have this overall compliance model, and then within that, we look, uh, we look at uh, RAS-WAS ratios for, for my process engineers on the line. Um, we look at aeration basins, the... Uh, Wastewater treatment uses some of the most energy within our utilities than, than any other plants, right? We have blowers constantly on, keeping our mixing up, and as well trying to maintain a, a high enough DO so that our bacteria remains happy and provides us with the cleaning uh, cleanliness that we need. Unfortunately, in a traditional loop control diagram, we have a reactive system that measures DO and says, okay, the DO of the water is three. I need it to be five. Turn up my blower until it gets to five, right? Uh, by using predictive uh, models or anything of the sort, we can guess that future, look at the actual uh, influent quality, and make a decision based off real-time uh, BOD data or real-time COD data. Um, what the mixed liquor is, we can use some of the oxygen already available in the water uh, and decrease the amount of energy requirement uh, by planning ahead and looking at the blower level. Hey, where's the optimum energy, uh, optimum operating point for this blower? Same thing as we do as with pumps. Can we leverage a better, uh, a better production point? basically, uh, and uh, use that instead of just adjusting it, you know, freely until we reach a very specific DO, whether or not the chemistry needs it, right? Um, there's a lot more, uh, I guess, uh, resistance in using this kind of technology within wastewater, mainly because uh, 
I'm getting a, a lot of people really have a hard time wrapping their heads around, hey, how can we really use machine learning around a biological model? But I would say to that, it's more so, hey, this is where we can use machine learning the most because it is a biological model. And that is where we know the most about. We have a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, I forget, uh, a lot of relationships already on BOD removal as a respect to DO or mixed liquor suspended solids, waste and, and return that we can create models, machine learning models within the limits of these, of these uh, biological processes that can learn faster than we already do. And, the, and, and this is already being used um, by universities and utilities uh, worldwide right now, because this is how we're starting to leverage machine learning to be able to understand uh, how COVID is affecting our populations, right? Uh, we're using real-time data to find correlations with the amount of infections to uh, based on uh, wastewater treatment, wastewater quality, right? Um, so the technology is there. And, and Javi, there is a question that came in that's uh... I think pertains us a little bit. Uh, question is how much of the inferences generated by the AI or ML processes are quote unquote, and I'm sure you get this a lot, black box, are the users provided with weighting summaries and correlation statistics uh, with the ability for adjustment and feedback? This is necessary to evolve from supervised to unsupervised learning. Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Uh, so it really depends on the type of model that is being used to generate recommendation where we can very, where we have, you know, a solid pathway towards uh, a relationship. Let's say, let's just talk wastewater uh, for simplicity's sake. Uh, we, we, we tend to use soft sensing strategies such as like what, what I'm showing up right now. Uh, where we find other correlations and then we create an inference based off of those correlations and we attach that correlation. And as long as it fits within um, a real-time uh, data A and real-time data B, and we're making that inference for somewhere in between, then as long as it fits, we're saying model, go ahead, provide a recommendation, treat it as a black box, right? Uh, in places where we can't use the soft sensing strategies, uh, we do have the ability to go in there and manually put in the data so that we could start making some of those predictions and those analyses based off this, uh, based off an adjusted value, as you would say. Now that does change how, uh, how the model will start to self adapt in those instances where we're we're personally intervening uh, with th with its model. Well, we're no we're, we're intervening as well with the type of machine learning that we use, whether we're going into deep learning, self learning, or and uh, self adapting, right? Because now we're just retraining to new rules versus letting it retrain itself. In those specific instances, we try to avoid them overall uh, by overriding uh, the, the, the program's, uh, I guess, willingness to keep moving or keep computating with our compliance models, right? We say, hey, here are your boundary conditions. There's no way you can exit these boundary conditions. So make your inference within the boundary conditions. And there's enough numerical information in, uh, and, and we're working at in 15 minute intervals as well that we are finding very little spaces unless we start looking at RO where 15 minutes of data or inferences uh, between 15 minutes of data are really making a big difference in uh, everyday processes or evolvement of how we treat our plants. Like your plant, it's not gonna go, your bugs don't die in 15 minutes, right? They'll die in an hour, but probably not in 15 minutes. Uh, really just depends on the size of a plant. But I don't know if I captured 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, there was one kind of follow up to that answer. They said, "Is yeah. we, you or us?" And I, to be honest, I missed what part of the answer they're they're talking to. But I imagine the answer. I imagine the answer to the question is with, with this product, uh, you actually work with a team of process engineers that not only helps with implementation of the Imagine uh, product, but they also help in the maintenance and retraining of the models. Um, so if there's like a, a you know major event or a, a, an event you want to calibrate to or something along those lines, uh, or if you're trying to retrain the models like Javi just mentioned, you would work with our team as well. So it's not, this is not yeah. a, a solution where it's like a, a, I guess a quote unquote out of the box solution. Um, there's definitely collaboration on both sides in terms of implementing this tool and maintaining it. Anything you want to add to that, Javi? Yeah, and, and I think you you said it in the right way. Uh, the product itself is really anything the imagination can take care of. Really what Innovise is providing is uh, and has is IP specific to uh, water models that have already pre-built uh, numerical relationships or chemical relationships uh, to facilitate uh, in soft sensing strategies and deep learning strategies and, and accelerate the computational analysis when trying to predict and forecast out into the, in the, in, in the future. In, in any other regards, Innovise for these types of projects at access pretty much a team of ML scientists and process engineers that work uh, usually uh, hand in hand with customer base to create a very specific model around a specific KPI, whether that be energy, greenhouse gas, chemical reduction, um, water quality, compliance, uh, anything of the sort that you can think of that may fit within uh, hey, we gather data for this and we'd like to make use of this data. That's where Indivise would come in uh, uh, and as a service, start helping build that. And then as subscription, give you real-time access to all of, all of that uh, analytics, live and self-adapting framework. And Javi, the, the last couple questions here are, are really going back to the platform as a whole. So I'll let you finish your presentation. Do you have more slides after this one? Um, I, I do, but I'd rather just stick with the questions. Um, I mean, the rest is mainly just more examples on how 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 it works. You know, sure. how it would uh, how one would make use of this information. Um, and of course, I've got a couple more data sets here as well uh, about our platform. So can you go so back to actually to the slide showing every kind of the integration of all the products and Innovise and, and the platform as a whole? I think that'll yeah. speak to these couple questions. So yeah, uh, the questions we're asking in terms of those interactive dashboards that we showed. Uh, you know, we're using Python or, or Java. Um, also, the other question was in terms of digital twins, what solutions are needed um, in order to actually, you know, take a look at the SCADA data and PNIDs, for example. So just to take a step back again for you guys, uh, really, and, and this is, I know it's convoluted because the name we're using was a product previously as well. Um, and again, yeah. you'll, you'll see a lot more about this from Innovise as a whole um, on our website and, and maybe through some emails as well. Um, but really, info360.com is the new cloud platform. So that is a platform that we have developed in conjunction. We've worked with Amazon Web Services on that platform. And uh, to go back to what I was saying earlier, we are moving all of our, or we have moved our operational analytics. So that is what we previously called Info360. So to answer the question about the dashboards that are used to create those insights, that was previously called Info360. And that is now what we're calling, as you can see on the screen, Info360 Insight. So the old Info360 functionality, which is like leak detection, uh, water loss calculations, or really what we're showing on the screen, any statistic that you want or any calculation that you want from your SCADA data can be put into a dashboard 
within the platform. And that's really focused on distribution systems. You know, we're, we're really talking about a pressurized system there in terms of using some of those uh, functionalities that were previously in Bo360. Um, but that is what we're talking about in terms of water loss, leak detection, et cetera. Um, but each of these are going to be separate modules. So info360.com is the entire platform. And, and basically our municipal customers and our consultant partners alike will be able to basically log in and use whatever module they want or need. So let's just take a, a hypothetical here. You have a, a utility that is storing all of their, you know, CMMS data, all their GIS data, uh, you know, all the water quality data, all this, you know, data that's being collected in the field would be stored in this info360.com platform. And then you can use the different modules depending on what your goals are or what analysis you're trying to do. And that goes for the consultants as well. So as the, as a utility is potentially storing all of their uh, assets within this platform, it gives the opportunity for the consultants to have a login to the same platform so they can use it to expedite their calibration uh, uh, process, whatever they're doing. So just to go back one more time to the picture here, info360.com is the entire platform. And then all of the modules are basically able to be picked out and you can use each module to process that data in different work. Um, so the info asset platform, that is incorporating what is historically our info asset manager and info asset planner solutions. Um, so, but, so for those of you who are on the call, uh, you know, info asset managers are CMMS solution, info asset planner kind of sits on top of it. And it's uh, our CIP solution that's really going to go into forecasting and planning for your assets. And then the third one we've been talking about today is Imagine. So that's yeah. our operator login that an operate that that one's really meant for operators so they can log in and, and get that well, Matt, advisory mode yeah to be clear i mean well like info asset uses ai strategies right so that we can forecast and create an automated cip imagine mm -hmm. uses ml machine learning right and you know, as we go into that future, machine learning as a whole is going to be an imagine as a whole. It's going to be an engine that drives almost all of these product lines, whether you'd be on the hydraulic model or info asset side, side, because you'd want something to start being able to self-correct and be able to keep your stuff calibrated. Um, but in forecasting out, uh, you know, you know, this platform with all these different modules, it, they, they are going to have very similar if, if anything, identical functionality to some of the things you see now, the outputs are going to be a lot more refined. And those are going to be um, function buttons in one dashboard, you know, kind of like what you see here, like where we have maps or alerting. And Imagine is not just for an operator. You know, Imagine can, um, can generate reports uh, e even externally on our, with our industrial clients. We, uh, we generate sustainability reports, live sustainability reports, so that people can publish uh, on their websites using APIs. Uh, hey, this is how much we've reduced in you know, water use and, and, uh, and energy and material consumption, right? So in that sense, it becomes like a, a very neat tool uh, for reporting and, um, and intelligent management so that you could run a business as well, right? Because uh, it, it's a prescriptive model. It's looking at, at, at the future and being able to tell, ask the, mach the AI, what do I need to do to get to this? Uh, maybe that's achieve X amount of revenue at a utility so that you can implement a CIP project. Or maybe that's, uh, that's something as small as like, hey, what's the max that I could, uh, that, that we could be charging, you know, right, for, for water rates based off, you know, assets on the ground, demand, and this regulatory framework, right? And if that it would spit those things out. So imagine could be useful for, for both um, an operator wanting to know where to where to set his pump, all the way up to the engineer who just wants to get to know a baseline of his of of, of his system so that they could do some analyses and alternative analyses for capital improvement projects. 
We, we did get a question if we could demo info360.com. Uh, I promise you that'll be on a water talks in the future, but I don't. We do not have that pulled up right now. Um, it is. So I think for those the closest of you wondering, what's that? we can get the closest we can get some of those things that I, right now that I was showing earlier. Like here's yeah, a demo I that's one, To be honest, to info360.com. But to, to answer your question, yeah. Andy, so info360.com is is already a real platform. Uh, yeah. To be completely frank, it's to be it's set to be GA or released later this month. Um, but it is a operating platform that we've uh, you know been working with some select customers up to this point on. Uh, but you guys, that's what I mean, where you guys will be seeing a lot more from Innovize within the next month uh, because this platform is live and ready to go. Uh, but we'll reach out to you directly about setting up that presentation with your rep, and we can definitely do that for you. Or um, give us a call. Give us a call yeah. and we'd be happy to to discuss kind of uh, opportunities that there are right now to try some of these things. Um, I, I'd be willing to explore with uh, with people that have some data out there uh, and see a good use for this, how we could maybe learn from each other and maybe give you a test run, right? Mm -hmm. And Javi, this is a good question too. I, I figured this one would be asked in terms of, you know, we're connecting multiple data points, you know, connecting uh, to the telemetry data. Uh, basically, obviously, the, there's opportunities for potential hacking. Has Innovise addressed any cybersecurity issues or recommendations raised with ISAC, OEA, et cetera? So I'll, I'll take this one first, Javi, and then you can add on to it. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Innovise is a very, uh, we, we've been around for quite a while, uh, over 30 years, I think. So in terms of data security, that, that's obviously at the top of our list. Um, in terms of a SaaS platform, we, we understand, or a cloud platform, we understand that's a new platform from us. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we did develop this with Amazon Web Services, actually you know, in conjunction with their developers. Uh, so we checked a lot of boxes just from working with them. Um, but to answer your question and uh, to add on to that, uh, we have a cybersecurity team and a cloud uh, security team and happy to set up a combo with them uh, around that conversation. But we, you know, we are checking off all the boxes in terms of uh, SOC 2 requirements. Uh, what were the other ones, Javi? The, the ISO requirements, security requirements as well. Um, so we're, we're definitely checking all the boxes and, and we're very uh, able to answer typically every single security question that comes up from our municipal customers. Um, so happy to take that offline uh, and, and yeah. discuss it further, but that's that's obviously something we've uh, had at the top of our list in the development of this platform. Um, any Anything you want to add to that, Javi? Um, I think that gives a very general overview, uh, and I think it's pretty good without getting too much into the details. Uh, but yeah, we, we do have a enterprise level cloud and uh, security infrastructure in place. Uh, and most of these uh, places where we connect to those uh, telemetry systems or SCADA systems, uh, we do use a secure FTP. And uh, mm -hmm. with a single point of contact, we, 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 pull, we pull, we do not pull servers we receive a push from servers too. So there's, you, most of the time, there's hardly any real instance where we're pulling uh, a customer server or we're going and requesting and taking data from a customer service. We're more so just acting as a catcher smith, uh, uh, ready to decrypt with a, with a secure, um, basically decryption key. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, all the data is encrypted on its way to our platform and in our platform. Uh, and then also, uh, we, we also have the opportunity with this platform to, uh, like Javi mentioned, you know, with, we're, we're, not, we're not necessarily connecting to the store in, we're really just pulling from it. So for most of our municipal customers, we're typically looking at a read only of that historian. Uh, it's not a direct connection to it. So a lot of times, uh, a lot of our customers like to put their historian on the other side of a firewall or a copy of it for us. So, you know, we're ensuring we're not touching really the, the uh, historian itself. Um, but happy to have that conversation offline as well. Um, 
here's kind of a high level question, Javi, that, that you might be able to answer pretty well since you've uh, implemented a few, uh, done this with quite a few municipal customers. Uh, I am sold on the importance of measurement and data, but will it be difficult to convince management? How have other utilities convinced management? And I guess to add on to that, Javi, how have you convinced management in the past? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> so actually, it, it really, I find that if I go high enough in an organization, it's relatively easy to start rolling the momentum of, hey, using the technology, right? Uh, it's going to usually middle management that normally is a little bit more, uh, takes a little bit more work. And really, it's just because a majority of us, our middle managers, are engineers, right? So our engineers really need to understand uh, the new one says of uh, machine learning or of, of decision making, that process flow or that logic diagram, in which case it takes a lot of conversations and a lot of knowledge share, which we're happy to, happy to do. There's also a very common misconception uh, I find within the, those groups uh, that, hey, we're going to be in all this money and uh, we're either not going to see a return or it's never really going to come back or we're going to have to redo it anyways in a couple of years right and and that's not necessarily the case that's not the case uh the process of ai implementation is us it, it's a stepped process uh when when you decide as an organization hey i want to i, I want to start digitally transforming my organization and getting ready to leverage these technologies uh, you don't just flip the switch and bam, uh, you now have a, uh, you know, an operator or uh, a digital operator that can analyze your system. There's a project associated with that. And that project is basically everybody has to come together, hold hands and uh, collaborate because really we cannot train a model efficiently without in-house expertise. And by in-house expertise, I mean in-house to your house. Um, I may understand water, wastewater systems from experience, but I don't understand the, the unique systems. So normally I have to definitely sell the project, right? Uh, hey, this is how we get started. Uh, we have a meeting first, Let's see where we can get, um, find applicability for. And many times what it turns to is, hey, proof, proofing the, the concept of uh, machine learning in, with a small little project. Maybe that's just a, a small chemical dosing station at a lift station or at a treatment plant or one, train, one treatment train at the treatment plant and uh, using that as a baseline for how everything could work. And then of course we have a, I don't know if anyone here has heard, but we have a very famous subscription model that uh, that looks um, th that prices entirely around a return on investment uh, of six months. So for managers that start looking at those finances, uh, we we contractually essentially put ourselves there. We put our skin in the game, uh, saying, "Hey, as long as we all work together and move forward uh, with this system." it will be priced such that it, it will pay itself off with the savings it provides, right? And that yeah. can go a long way, uh, can go a long way to helping management hop on board and getting started with some of these tools. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I'll add to that is, is most folks know on the call probably, um, you know, as engineers, we know that our solution is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, yeah. whether it's this solution or one of our desktop solutions like Info Water, ICM, or Info Swim, uh, you know, those those solutions are what we call more out of the box, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but any of our solutions, but even more so, the live uh, kind of analytic solutions are, are definitely, you know, just one piece of the puzzle and a part of the process. So, you know, internal workflows are important. And then as Javi mentioned, one of the things we do with our live products is we set up a workshop where we just see if you're ready for this type of solution. You know, if you don't have the infrastructure available uh, to, to really send us that data in real time, for example, or near real time, then it, it, it's kind of a mute, a mute point, you know? So we, we go through that process with our, uh, with our prospects or with our customers in terms of 
determining if, if this type of solution is a good fit um, in terms of the municipality themselves. Yeah. Um, so it is a little bit more, I guess, custom, you know, for lack of a better word, than, than I would say than some of our yeah. other box solutions. It's really close to heart to me because I genuinely believe we should all be making use of this technology, right? Especially in, in an instance where it can pay for itself. Uh, we kind of, uh, you know, I, I pay water bills, you know, so I'd like to think and I like to understand that, hey, are we leveraging everything we can to have our systems running as smoothly as they should be or could be? If we're not ready today, then we can uh, we can start preparing for that for that day where we can start using that. And an Innovice being our uh, water being our business, uh, we we want to have those conversations and help prepare, especially our partners and existing clients, even if that day is two years from now. Right? Give us a call. We can have that conversation today. And most of the time, what that turns into is just like a a meetings minute, a meeting minutes saying, hey, this is what we found. These are kind of the gaps of, of being able to implement such system, but this is the first steps you can take. And here's the, sometimes it's a small investment. Uh, I know a good uh, customer of, our, of ours in Canada, um, all they needed to invest in was, you know, $2,800 on, on a sensor for their treatment plant in order to install one of these systems, right? $2,800, that's a PO for like, uh, their savings was somewhere around $30,000 for, for the year, but which isn't, wasn't like high six figures or anything like that. But when you look at that cost benefit analysis of wait, $2,800 versus the 38,000 or $38,000 you could save, well, then uh, it makes sense, and we can help organizations uh, figure those things out. Yep. And uh, last question here, I want to answer with a couple minutes left: Is, is does this platform predict I and I? Uh, I'll reach out offline on that one as well. I, I wouldn't say this platform is necessarily the one to calculate I and I. I would say that's more focused on our. Uh, desktop modeling solutions. So uh, with InfoSwim, uh, there is a module in the suite, I believe, that is called the RDII Analyst. Um, so if you have InfoSwim, there is a module built into that as well. Uh, and then and then our workgroup products, I know, have different mechanisms to help with those calculations, specifically InfoWorks ICM uh, is yeah. real good at handling some INI &I analyses as well. So I wouldn't say what we discussed today is necessarily the, the spot to do those I and I calculations. Yeah. Although I'm sure you know there is a place for it in terms of uh, setting up I would the send, dashboard. Go ahead, yeah, Adi. I, I would send people to ICM Live. Yep. You know, yep. I think that would be the great tool on our product base to do those those predictions and analyses, and then ask that those those. Um, Features get put into our platform. Oh, we'll it will be in the platform. Learning. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it will uh, be in the it will people. be in the platform. Yes, yes, it will be in the platform. But as we see those features get transferred into that platform, form, you'll see machine learning start, you know, refine those numbers. Now, if you have a project in mind uh, and you are collecting enough data within your sewer system. Uh, we can work with rain gauges, sewer flow meters, and stuff like that to develop a, a, an, an ML solution for for you specifically, especially if you're in an area that you know gets very sporadic rain, uh, sporadic times, uh, like north northwest, for instance, or anything like that. Um, the technology is there; we have it available. But if you want quicker kind of solution uh, right out of the box, I'd say go to ICM Live or uh, our ICM products suite. Um, or of course, we can look into developing a, a sort of uh, machine learning model for it. All right, well, uh, we are right uh, a minute past the hour now. So uh, we do have a couple more questions. We'll be sure to follow up uh, with those via email. So apologies to those who we did not get to your questions yet, but 
Um, thanks everybody for joining. Be sure to check our website for future Water Talks presentations. We do do this every Tuesday. And I believe next week is focused on Ruby scripting within our InfoWorks platform. Um, that's with Nathan again, and also one of our uh, that's partners. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that'll be one pretty deep in the weeds. So um, yeah. hopefully you guys can join us next week and we will, uh, I hope everybody can stay safe and we'll be in touch on those questions that went unanswered. Um, thanks for joining us and hope everybody has a good rest of your day. Thanks, Avi.